France, Historians, the Nation, and Liberty. In the year 1815, after 25 years of turmoil, France was left a nation united and safe in her existence, but without a clear identity. The calls for liberty, egality, and fraternity had grown much fainter, but the question remained whether these ideals had been best realized in the Girondists' limited monarchy, the Jacobins' republic, or Napoleon's empire, and to what degree and in which form they should be asserted now. Although the Bourbons, once more in power, simply tried to ignore the immediate past, the problem of the proper model for France's society did not fade away. For nearly 60 years, France shaped and reshaped her body politic in search for that proper form, and historians were her most prominent guides in that endeavor of liberty, egality, and fraternity. That role turned out to be as powerful an incentive for writing history as the quest for national unity had been for German historians, advocates of tradition and continuity. After the year 1815, the Catholic Church, in contrast to secular institutions, offered a continuity undamaged by revolutionary ideals or changes. It never had rejected the old France or viewed the revolution as a fulfillment of France's destiny. On the contrary, shortly after the reign of terror had ended, one of the church's advocates, Joseph de Maistre, defined the French Revolution not just as a conspiracy by an evil few, but as a consequence of collective sin, a view which made revolutionary ideals unworthy of shaping French development in the future. The Catholic Church and the Catholic view of the past was presented much more elaborately by Francois René de Chateaubriand, in his The Genius of Christianity, 1802. The past knew only the one truly revolutionary event when the modern age was created at the foot of the cross, and the human condition changed completely. Of course, all human attempts to change conditions radically and quickly had to fail because they were based on the dream of human control over forces which were completely unknown, forces subject only to divine providence. The French past illustrated how the true, the gradually changing, and the lawful ways prevailed over all sudden and violent changes. Hence the church, which was a stable, essential, and moral force in that society, and it offered still once more a reliable basis for France's future than the untested ideas of the rationalists and the revolutionaries of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Chateaubriand rejected the idea of a secular progress. Indeed, the cultivation of rationality in isolation from emotion and imagination was not only of no social benefit, it destroyed a civilization by eroding age-old tradition. Rather than re resembling a staircase leading up to the present, the past showed a sequence of equally valid periods. Chateaubriand particularly wished to rescue the reputation of the France of chivalry. That appreciation fit well into the restoration periods since for the French past. It was then that a whole period, the Middle Ages, was rescued from the derision of rationalists. Of course, there was also the desire no longer to skip over centuries of the French past and celebrate the Roman Republic and its heroes as idols of the revolution. But now it made sense to do what Joseph Micaud did, to go to the archives and spend years in studying and writing about the history of the Crusades. Those endeavors consisted, consisted sheer folly by the philosophes with the renewed affirmation of God's providence, obviating the need to find an order imminent in human events, J. F. Micod and Prosper de Barante, in his History of the Dukes of Burgundy, 1364 to 1477, could without embarrassment follow the precept of the Ecole narrative, right to tell, not to judge. Historians of that school painted grand and colorful pictures rich in detail and drama. History became a tableau of magnificent evocations of the past, but they stood side by side, lacking any sense of development. The French narrative historians drifted with the broad current, which also pushed along Sir Walter Scott, Prosper uh, Merrimy, and countless romantics. The age was too agitated by the wish to find and secure the proper French form of social and political organization to be satisfied by the historical portraits of the Ecole narrative. The contemporary intellectual climate and the sense for development engendered by the revolution were detrimental to history as a series of portraits. Instead, a new stage began in the old quest for clarifying the French identity. One as old as Fredegar's tale 
of the Trojan origin of the Franks. Fittingly, the early attempt by Augustan theory not only favored the Gauls as true ancestors, but also provided a dynamic explanatory scheme for France's development through the ages. He found it while preparing his History of the Conquest of England by the Normans, published in 1825. One day when I had attentively read over some chapters of David Hume, I was struck with an idea which seemed to me a ray of light, and exclaimed as I closed the book, All this dates from a conquest. There is a conquest underneath. A people conquers a people, and the repercussions shape history. In England, the resistance to the Normans explained almost everything, including the guerrillas Anglo-Saxons after 1066, the deeds of Robin Hood, and the murder of Thomas A. Becket, whose fight for church sovereignty was really a deed on behalf of the Anglo-Saxons. Eventually, the conquered won out with the triumph of the middle class. In a similar manner, the Germanic migrations in early French history brought conquest, domination by the Germanic element in the Carolingian period, and finally a liberation of France by the Gallo-Romans. At first, in France, it was a straight conflict between the race of conquerors and the race of the conquered. Later, that conflict became a more subtle social struggle, and theory's definitions of the two races grew a bit hazier. He continued to speak out, however, for the conquered, who were once our forefathers, the Gallo-Romans, ensconed in the towns and who later were identified with the Third Estate, which included simply La Masse de la Nobles. Theory's view of his history as an ongoing struggle between two unevenly powerful groups, proceeding relentlessly along a predetermined course and toward a known end, impressed no less a man than that of Karl Marx. Subsequently, the search for the true spirit of France went forward once more along lines that some 16th century legalist legists had suggested and that the Abbe Dubose had reinforced the, in the 18th century. In his History of the Gauls, Augustan Theory's brother, Amidi, championed the thesis of France's Celtic origin, which in the 1850s became a favorite view. Henry Martin's popular volumes on the history of France celebrated the Celtic spirit of France, while Michel credited the Celtic element with the contributing, with contributing the love of equality to the French spirit. Only Gaelic France was truly unique because she was generally free of Germanic ties. At that point, however, the search for the unique French character away from Germany still remained at a safe distance from chauvinistic cravings since it satisfied many of the romantic need for national self-assertion rather than any desire to belittle other people. Thus, the leading liberal historian, Francois uh, Guizot, respected the Germans and liked the English. He celebrated the French as cultural leaders, but considered them to be a racial mix between the Celts, Romans, and Germans. The romantic quest for a French history based on the supposition of a unique French spirit one transcending all partisan divisions, culminated in the works of Jules Michelet. After he produced a short textbook on the history of the modern world, he earned the chance to enter into academic institutions of rank, particularly the College Collège de France, and to become, through Guizot's sponsorship, head of the historical section of the National Archives. Vico, and to a lesser degree, Herder, influenced the young Michelet. He translated and abridged, some would say paraphrased, Vico's New Science, coming like Vico from the world of the Catholic faith with its essences and stability, Michelet too felt the need to come to terms with change. Vico could accept history as the tale of the rise and fall of cultures because he simply believed in God's providence. Michelet, lacking Vico's trust in divine providence, found a mere sequence of cultures depressing and instead depicted the line of successive cultures in an ascending spiral whose aim he later defined as ever fuller human liberty. From his 18th century mentors, Michelet gained an understanding for the concept of Volk and an enhanced appreciation of the essential role of language and of myth. But he proceeded beyond such understanding to a radical affirmation of the cosmos as an organic whole. Nature, France, the people, and individuals were once in essence and development. Hence he could speak of himself as France and speak of history as rousing the dead. The same cosmic spirit obliterated the divisions of time and pervaded his work through the co documents to which he, as an archivist, had easy access to and which he cherished. He viewed the archives as catacombs of manuscripts, 
this wonderful necropolis of national monuments, and the documents as not papers but lives of men, of provinces, and of nations. Attempts to explain the development of the French spirit and nation as the work of abstract forces or physical conditions were, of course, futile. Michelet also rejected all explanations of history on the basis of race or conflict, which was uh, the idea of theory, uh, the laws of stages, which was Vico's interpretation, and environmental determinism. The spirit of a people unfolded spontaneously, except that through time and dif the different spirits of peoples have contributed to the general growth of human freedom. Now, in the mid-19th century, France had become the principal agent of freedom, a role formerly played by the Germans, and had to pay a corresponding price. Frenchmen of all conditions, of all classes, remembers one thing. You have but one sure friend on this earth, France. In the eyes of the still subsisting coalition of aristocracies, it will ever be a crime that 50 years ago you attempted to give the world freedom. Be assured, France will never bear any but one name in the mind of Europe, that inex inexpiable name, which is also its true and eternal one, the revolution. The French nation, with its unique spirit dedicated to freedom and the cross, was, central, was the central figure in Michelet's history of France. In The People, 1846, the spirit of France was celebrated once more. All social differences and tensions were resolved in the community of the French, which for Michelet reached beyond the limits of the bourgeoisie to include the peasants and the workers. He said, one people, one country, one France. Never, I pray you, let us become two nations. But by then, the cross, one of the two elements which Michelet had discerned in the French spirit, had suffered in the historian's esteem. A better conflict with the Jesuits over the control of education made Michelet reconsider the role of Christianity. He brought to bear on the church his judgment on institutions, the assertion that life created the institutional forms, but only the creative drive of life itself has lasted undiminished throughout the centuries. Each historical phenomenon, be it feudalism or the order born of revolutions, drew its strength initially from the people's intuitive knowledge of life's needs. But as time went on, institutions lapsed into a formalized routine, maintained themselves by bureaucracies, and then decayed in the process. The Catholic Church, which he now bitterly resented, had lost its pure vigor with Louis XIV. The French Revolution also fell into the hands of those who calculated, reasoned, and stripped life of emotion. The villain here was Ros uh, Robespierre. The desire for freedom remained the only visible and uncorrupted manifestation of life's all-pervasive creative force, and the historian must grasp that desire above all. This notion helped him to justify subjective visions of periods and of peoples as substitutes for do documented studies. Guizot an analyses, theory narrates, I resurrect, he said, and strove to recall the past from the dead in vivid and picturesque word paintings, brilliantly colored and pointillist in detail. Con consequently, in the last volumes of the history of France, hi history became simpler. Love and hatred had clear objects. The Middle Ages and their clerical culture lost all their brilliance and were replaced by the Renaissance as the period of full of light. The great lesson appeared clearer than ever. What life and its agent, the people, create, the evil elites of power and calculation corrupt. The center of French history must be the people, however vaguely defined they were by Michelet. Historians as Champions of Liberty Michelet's French nation as a mystical whole inspired many, but offered little advice on how to solve France's gravest internal problem. How much influence would the ideals of the French Revolution be granted in the shaping of the French society and state? The Bourbons, once restored, defined narrow limits of realization and tolerated no advocacy beyond them. That provoked a battle for French public opinion that the advocates of widening popular rep representation used the editorial rooms of newspapers and the lecture halls of universities as their bastions and history as their main weapon. The opposition to the Bourbons couched its advocacy of a moderate realization of the revolutionary ideals in a discussion of the role of the French Revolution in French history. De Maistre and Chateaubriand had stressed the revolution's Jacobin phase with its reign of terror in order to prove that the continuity of French development had been broken in the 1790s, and the French Revolution therefore stood outside of French history. In the 1820s, Francois Mignet and Adolphe Thiers 
con contradicted such ne negative assessments by basing their interpretation on what would eventually become a liberal dogma. The French Revolution took place in the course of the inevitable development of freedom, which by implication would reach its apogee, apogee in the rule of the Third Estate. Its moderate phase from 1789 to 1793 stood well within the French tradition and by implication should be continued in a constitutional monarchy. Its radical phase was brought about by the needs of war. Thiers added to that another assurance for the necessary triumph of moderation. He used the mechanical analogy of pressure to uh, speak of oppression and counterpressure to speak of the demand for justice in order to explain why revolutions have occurred and why after a while they all lose strength. When concessions have been wrenched from the old ruling group, some social strata now satisfied desert the desert the revolutionary cause and the counterpressure weakens. He explained the Jacobin period as one of the greatest counterpressure as one, uh, without condoning it. In any case, history showed how peaks of revolutionary violence have never lasted because every society must offer order as well as justice and liberty to its citizens. As Thiers saw it, the Jacobins, like other advocates of democracy, asserted only libertas and thus brought and will always bring chaos. In the year 1820, Augustan theory had demonstrated not only the prominence of conflict, but also how the idea of libertas had all along been part of the French tradition, akin to the true French spirit and the winning cause. He credited the Gallo-Romans with upholding the ideal of libertas and located the birthplace of institutionalized libertas in the towns of the Middle Ages. Liberty's historical agent, and hence the true carrier of the national interest, had been the Third Estate, which in the revolution's moderate phase had finally received full recognition and by implication should receive such recognition again. The liberal view of the past also found historians such as Jean-Charles Lenard uh, Simon de Sismondi, who went beyond the romantic notion that the cause of liberty was rooted in a specific Volkgeist. Volkgeist. Although Jacobin regimes in Geneva had forced the Simon uh, Simon family into first an English and then an Italian exile, Charles Simon, Simon de, better known as Sismondi, always dreamed of republics in which all citizens would share the rights and duties of government. But, and most of the contemporary liberals would agree with him, that he consciously hedged, let power remain with those who comprehend its objects, that is, with those who are educated and propertied. A history of the Italian republics of the Middle Ages, from 1807 to 1814, was published and celebrated that type of liberty. Wherever liberty had been cherished in the past, there had been virtue, and its result was a glorious civilization. The Italian cities enjoyed for three centuries the protection and progressive improvement of their municipal constitutions. These three centuries, from 1100 to 1400, and roughly the uh, beginning of the 12th century to the beginning of the uh, 15th century, with reference to the rest of Europe, are utterly barbarous. Florence prospered as a republic with citizens and decayed as a indice fiefdom with subjects. Simonde became so enthusiastic about the Italian role in the history of freedom that he discovered an Italian branch of his family and added Sismondi to his name. The high pitch of excitement on behalf of liberty could not be maintained in his latter history of the French. His 19-volume work lacked luster. It was soon overshadowed by Guizot's and Michelet's histories, much of Sismond's cosmopolitan image of the beneficial rule of communal republics proved no match for the union of liberty and that of the French spirit. From 1820 until well into the 1840s, these and other French historians transformed French history into the ultimate weapon for the defense of liberty. To call them propagandists would be to misrepresent them, for that term erases the faintly drawn but firm line which separates earnest conviction from propaganda, that deliberate misuse of the past. Guizot, in whose History of Civilization in France, 1830, divine providence guided the course of liberty, would have either not understood the reproach or become angry. For him, the view of French history that depicted the shifting of power from clergy to aristocrats to kings and finally to the middle class or the bourgeoisie was simply the true reflection of the grand scheme of history. God designed it, and humans made it reality. Men do not make the whole of history. It has laws of higher origin, but in history men are unrestricted agents who
who produced its results. Taking the history of France in its totality in all its phases, the Third Estate has been the most active and the most decisive element in French civilization. The Third Estate was superb, uh, superbly fitted to dominate, since it was open to all those who were educated, who, those who were able to discuss things rationally, and those who were willing to do their duty. That was what Gizzo had found in his research, what he believed, and it is what he proclaimed out of convi conviction, not for narrow and temporary partisan purposes. In the gradual transfer of power to the middle class or the bourgeoisie, the Jacobin phase, frightening as it was, represented a mere sideshow. The logic of events and Gizzo's Calvinist background showed in his sense of destiny or predestination more than in his austere and aloof behavior, tolerated no long-range deviation from the grand scheme of things, which prescribed a peaceful, gradual progression to the juste milieu. That proper state of affairs was the constitutional monarchy based on the power of the middle class of the bourgeoisie. There would be no development beyond the constitutional monarchy, since beyond it lay only the rule of the fourth estate, which for French liberals amounted to mob rule. In 1848, Guizot lost his position of prime minister by a revolution which had been signaled all through the 1840s. The kingship of Louis-Philippe proved as temporary as the identification of his limited constitutional monarchy with the apogee, apogee of freedom and of the third estate. The monster of republicanism and democracy, as Guizot called it, had come back to life. In liberal histories, the constant advancement of liberty was prescribed by the logic of events. Libertas provided the moving force in human events, and its fulfillment represented the aim of all development. In a period of longing for a constitutional government with measured popular participation, such a logic of events proved a rich source of hope for eventual victory. That it also con constituted a deterministic view of the past escaped its advocates, but not Chateaubriand, who criticized liberal history as a fatalistic school of thought which deprived human life of drama and even worse of its moral dimension. Of course, we know that he was wrong, but if all that happened, it was necessary or at least advantageous for the cause of liberty, then the reign of terror with its thousands of victims could be condemned no more than the medieval plague, another inevitable event. There was for Chateaubriand a contradiction in viewing liberty at the same time as a source of historical necessity and as the greatest moral force. The Bonapartist Phenomenon All along, Napoleon Bonaparte had posed a delicate problem of interpretation for French historians. He had, had he destroyed or saved the ideals and institutions of the French Revolution? During his rule, few had touched the question. Those who did found two alternatives to choose from, a stoic acceptance of revolutions and all of their consequences as demonstrated by Francois E. de Toulendion, who resigned himself to the fact that revolutions are the political crises uh, as inevitable in the moral order of societies as are the physical revolutions in the material order of the universe. Or, praise of Napoleon as a constructive force as voiced by Jean C. D. de La Cretelle, who maintained his positive attitude even under the Bourbons, shifting his emphasis to Napoleon's role in securing France against a return of, of the terror. Through his memoirs, Napoleon I proved a capable spokesman on behalf of his own cause. In the France of the 1820s, where many were either bored by or hostile to the Bourbons, the Napoleonic period took on pleasing colors. Even Thiers, in his history of the French Revolution, showed sympathy for Napoleon's reach for power in the Coupe de l'Etat of November 8, 1799. The Napoleonic problem became more than one of historical interpretation when Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, wrote his The Napoleonic Ideals, not as a commemoration, but as a call for a new Napoleonic France. Paradoxically, by the 1840s, uh, one saw the critical assessment of the Napoleonic period from the same uh, La Cretelle, who earlier had been its advocate, but in old age had changed his mind. Yet one critical look was a book that was no match for the surge in post-Napoleonic sentiment caused by the bloody days of June 1848, when workers tried to gain justice, but in the eyes of those who preferred moderate parliamentary reforms, seemed to threaten the lawful order and the existing social structure. By December of 1851, France was governed by Napoleon III. 
Napoleon III had a strong sense of his historical role as the savior of French society and of his status as a historical figure, and he wrote history accordingly. In 1865, his History of Julius Caesar appeared full of implied analogies. Theirs is 20-volume History of the Consulate and the Empire, published between 1845 and 1862, represented the most respectful, sympathetic assessment of the Napoleonic period. It portrayed Napoleon as a force of order who stabilized the achievements of the French Revolution. But that judgment, Thiers argued, referred to the Napoleon of 1802, a sage, and not the Napoleon of 1812, a madman. Thiers used, doc used documents, prior works, and eyewitness reports, painted brilliant scenes in detail, and kept matter-of-factly to the truth that, as he perceived it. That explains why, after an initial short imprisonment and exile, Thiers could live as a celebrated national historian in the empire and become the first president of the republic following Napoleon III's downfall. Napoleon III turned Edgar Quin Quinet into a disillusioned exile who now called for an abandonment of the liberal thesis on history. Throughout the centuries, France had not followed a path towards liberty. France had been liberal in ideas, but servile in practice. Liberal historians had been blinded by their stipulation of a necessary development towards libertas, and when they had seen in everything a good purpose, had forgotten the moral dimension of history. The French revolutions of 1789 and 1848 were not shining examples of how libertas assessed, asserted itself, because in each case the people had betrayed liberty. Having abandoned the vision of France as the agent of libertas, Quinet transferred that role to the United States of America. For some of the Bonapartist controversy was a mere surface phenomenon of the political order dominated by the middle class, or the bourgeoisie. They remembered that the revolutionary clamor had not only been for liberty, but also for equality, and pointed out that one of the major social groups of the developing industrial society, the workers, the bourgeoisie, remained outside of the existing political structure. The study of the past and present yielded new propaganda, uh, prop uh, prognostications as to where the future development would carry France and other countries. In his London exile during Napoleon III's reign, Louis Blanc expressed his compassion for the laborers and saw the doom of the monarchy and bourgeoisie dominance. His historical works portrayed the French Revolution's reign of terror as no aberration but a necessary defensive action on behalf of a revolutionary regime, regime threatened by outside armies, the compromise of G uh, Girondists and skeptics like Danton. Louis Blanc's appeal for a reconciliation between bourgeoisie and bourgeois and pro proletariat went unheard. It was not in season yet. After all, even Karl Marx had failed in 1848 to rouse people with his communist manifesto. Liberty and equality also interested an eminent analysis, analyst of political structures who found a disquieting relationship between the two ideals. Alexis de Tocqueville had toured Jacksonian America and had been fascinated by what strange Democrat, that strange democratic world. But could America and the Americans teach any lesson to other countries? A society with seemingly unlimited space, a sense of mission, the absence of a feudal past, and a people who were egalitarian, self-reliant, and egotistic, although still good citizens? They could, de Tocqueville thought, because all democracies share basic structural features. He urged that democracy be understood as an all-pervasive way of life and not merely as a political form of organization. By such a definition, America was a democracy but not ancient Athens. Yet exactly because democracy was more than a political form, it possessed a complex inter inner dynamic. On the one hand, democracy releases enormous creative energies and provides for great social mobility. On the other hand, its egalitarian spirit erodes all institutions and social mobility, as well as all associations that are now perceived as restraints to individual fulfillment, but also, so far, have sheltered the individual from the central power of the state. Gradually, the individual becomes isolated. He exists in a vacuum of values and seeks stability in the conformity enforced by a mass society. Thus, the relentless quest for individual liberty will lead paradoxically to an excessive egalitarianism which will destroy libertas, understood as the space in which the individual can operate freely. By implication, de Tocqueville defined the possible destination of a democratic Western civilization. Totalitarianism. A more promising direction pointed towards a democracy which did not de uh, 
defy the masses and egalitarianism and instead preserved a variety of institutions and associations vis-a-vis -vis the central state. Safeguarded with the strength of religion and tamed all destructive passions by a constitution. Hence, one must be aware that revolution, revolutions posed less a danger to democracies, indeed to any social order at that, than the slow and gradual developments which sap the strength of societies. De Tocqueville showed how, in the interest of the centralization of power, the structure of the old regime had been eroded by a slow and steady deconstruction of its multiple centers of power to such a degree that the French Revolution could easily destroy the shell that had remained.